Hello everyone, my name is Mateusz Kwiatkowski, as Mieszko said, uh, I'm a senior software engineer uh, at the embedded team here at AV System. And I'll be talking a bit about effective debugging of uh, embedded C. Uh, so, first of all, why do we need debugging? This is because, like you know the old uh, Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong, but we cannot just live with it. We cannot just tell our bosses and customers and users that our software will never work. So we need to do something about it. Uh, I will start by talking a little bit about uh, things you probably al already know about debugging. Uh, but first of all, I'll introduce you to this little snippet of code, uh, which has a bug in it, but uh, some of the more um, inclined of you might say that uh, there is actually a lot of wrong things with this code. For example, uh, stringifying a floating point number is maybe not something you should be doing yourself. Maybe you should use printf or, or some, something else from the standard library. Uh, also, you have this uh, division by 10, which loses floating point precision, obviously. Uh, and also there is a recursive call here, which is a big no-no in some embedded situations. Uh, but uh, those are some compromises that uh, sometimes have to be make, made. So uh, this is actually not the point. This is actually not the bug that we are looking for. The bug that we are looking for is that, uh, well, of course, it, it works uh, if we pass 1.5 E6. This is what uh, is supposed to be output, but uh, 10.0, this is not really how the exponential uh, not notation works. Uh, also, we wanted it to start with uh, exponent of six, but it doesn't. So you probably already see that this one should be greater or equal, and this one should be greater or equal as well. But uh, how do we get there? Of course, the first method of debugging that you probably learn is debugging using printf. Uh, so you uh, put some not really nice words <laughs> in your code uh, that are output to the console. Uh, and uh, you see those not very nice words telling you where the code is being executed and what values are there. And uh, you can reason, for example, that uh, in this case, uh, we are not entering this loop. Uh, and for the one E6 variant, you just got one, one message. So you can uh, see that even this if isn't, isn't triggered, right? Uh, but there are, of course, many problems with this approach. Uh, we need to put strings somewhere. And in embedded, we often don't really have much place in the flash memory to put all the strings. Uh, also, we need a standard I.O. or something like that, uh, which is especially, um, this is especially problematic in this case because we are re-implementing printf, basically. We are implementing, uh, outputting the floating point number. So uh, we need to output floating point number. This is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem in this case, but also we need to output this somewhere. We need a serial port or a monitor or something like that. Uh, of course, we probably have a serial port of some kind, but there are race conditions. For example, if we are outputting something else on the serial port, then uh, putting more logs might uh, cause some other problems. Mm. So another thing you probably know how to use is a debugger, like GDB on this, let's call it a screenshot. Um, so using a debugger uh, like GDB or LLDB uh, that you can use from the command line or in uh, GUI, you can use something like Visual Studio or IR. Uh, so there many IDEs have uh, debuggers integrated. Um, other IDEs uh, are wrappers around command line debuggers, like you can use in VS Code or Eclipse or, or C-Lion. Uh, and using the debugger, you can do stuff like single stepping, like execute one line of code at one at, uh, at a time. Uh, you can put breakpoints so that execution stops when you reach some point in the code. Uh, you can use watch points so you can see that 
uh, when a variable changes, then the execution will uh, stop. Uh, you can also uh, print values of variables uh, in the command line or, or in a window. Uh, you can even modify them. Uh, you can uh, do this assembly. Basically, debuggers are very, very neat, very nice tool. Uh, but we are working with embedded. So we've got a couple of problems, obviously. Uh, to get the code to fit on our device, we probably need to turn on optimizations. And if you ever traced through optimized codes, then you know that it is an experience. <laughs> and also, uh, we need to know about the limitations of uh, embedded hardware, because uh, we can have a limited number of breakpoints, so, so we can we are not able to just use them as we want. Uh, watch points may not even work or, or behave weirdly. Uh, and we need a debug probe. Some development boards usually have them included on the board. But if we have something uh, uh, other than a development board, then sometimes we can get away with using another device of, some, of the same kind, like with the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, but if we have a really production device, then uh, we need an external probe and something like this nice J-Link costs 400 euros, which is interesting. Some other probes are a little bit cheaper, but uh, basically we have a lot of problems and if that even weren't enough, then uh, there are other limitations. For example, uh, production devices may have uh, if uses that disable the ability to be debugged uh, at all. Or we can have secure code like Arm Trust Zone, where also by design you cannot debug that code uh, using a debug probe. So if we are developing code for the secure enclave, then we need to somehow get around that. And if that wasn't enough in itself, then we have the kind of bugs that other developers don't even know, like uh, we may have unlined accesses that uh, don't crush the code, but just do something very weird. Uh, we may have bugs in our RTOS. So, uh, for example, we once had a bug that caused the stack to go totally out of alignment, but only if you were passing a 64-bit integer or uh, floating point value through an ellipsis like a printf. So you have very sneaky bugs sometimes. Um, if you have wrong settings for your compiler, then you can have race condition in the function preamble. That also happened in real life, and you can read about that on the blog article that is linked on this slide. Uh, and uh, sometimes vendors provide you with some drivers with C code, but it only works when optimizations are disabled. Uh, you can have problems with caches and DMAs and all very interesting stuff. So what do we do about it? Well, uh, I have some tips for you to make your debugging experience hopefully a little bit easier. Uh, I'll start with a little tip that doesn't really have much to do with embedded development, but I really uh, encourage uh, every one of you to learn how to use GDP from the command line. Uh, this is because, uh, first of all, it's not that hard, and you can have uh, things like uh, GDP's integrated TUI to uh, ease the learning curve. There, there are also things like GDP dashboard. Uh, but uh, when you use GDP from the command line, you can effortlessly integrate with external tools that uh, build on top of GDP, like Valgrind or RR, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later. Also, GDP can be extended with uh, scripting, with Python uh, modules and so on. You can write them yourself to, for example, examine your uh, custom data structures, things like that. So really using GDP from the command line instead of GUI is uh, really worth it, in my opinion. Uh, you can even do a little bit ad hoc scripting. For example, uh, if you create a breakpoint and then type commands, then you can type a list of commands that will be executed when that breakpoint hits. Uh, so this is something that I really did in real life uh, when I, I had a really sneaky bug. For, uh, in fact, when debugging this race condition, generated by the compiler. Uh, so uh, I was uh, 
just basically single stepping through the code, but automatically. And uh, I didn't really know where to put the breakpoint, but I wrote a little ad hoc script that checked when the memory corruption happened. And that is the way I caught the bug in, in the end. Uh, also, when watch points don't work, then yeah, you can do that to emulate watch points. You can, you can basically single step uh, in a loop and see if, if the value changed. Another tip is that, like I said, uh, watch points don't often really work on embedded. Uh, the, part of that is because if you type watch some variable in GDB, then it will actually try to evaluate it uh, everywhere, but you might be in another function and there is no such variable anymore. Uh, there is watch minus L, which is supposed to uh, watch a specific location in memory, but uh, I tried to use it and it didn't actually work for some reason. Uh, so what always works is if you have a variable, you can take its address and put an asterisk before it and watch that. It might not look pretty, but it works and it never failed me. Um, yeah, but you also may uh, do that to, for example, if you put a watch point uh, and reboot the board, then it will also be triggered when uh, the memory is initialized. You have this startup script, which is uh, assembly script, and uh, basically zeroes out all the data section in the memory. And uh, you will also get that watch points triggered uh, then. You will also get it triggered when the operating system initializes some memory and so on. Uh, one more thing that is very much, maybe not necessary, but comes in very handy is learning how to read assembly. You, you probably don't need to write anything in assembly, but being able to understand a little bit of that uh, really helps. For example, you can single step on the assembly level, on the uh, machine instruction level, instead of single stepping through uh, compiled through C code, uh, which may actually be helpful and may actually be more uh, easy to understand when you are debugging through optimized code. Uh, you can use, for example, godbolt.org uh, compiler explorer to correlate what is happening in the code with what is happening in uh, the machine code because uh, that tool helpfully provides some color coding between lines of uh, both uh, versions of uh, the same routine. Uh, to do something in the other direction, you can use one of the better things that came from the total uh, privacy violations of American NSA, uh, you can use Ghidra. Uh, this is a very powerful tool for uh, decompiling and uh, disassembling and analyzing uh, binary software. Uh, of course, you should probably check with legal if such reverse engineering is allowed or don't tell anybody about you doing it. Uh, but uh, you can feed it with some binary application uh, and it will try its best to get something that resembles C code with the same semantics. Sometimes it does really well, sometimes it does meh, uh, but you can at least get an idea of, of what is going on in, in the assembly code and this uh, can be used, for example, uh, if you have uh, some bootloader, you may even have uh, source code for it, but you don't know what exact compile options have been used when uh, compiling it and uh, many software is uh, totally configurable at uh, compile time. Uh, so if you don't know which options were used to compile the version you have, uh, you can just decompile it and see what is going on. Another thing that comes really handy is instrumentation. Instrumentation is basically when you have the compiler insert code in your application for you automatically. Uh, there are many different uh, use cases for instrumentations. For example, you have Google sanitizers like address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, and so on, uh, which uh, put some checks in your code to check if you are violating memory or, or doing undefined behaviors and so on. Uh, you can have uh, Control flow protection, which is actually 
enabled by default on modern Linux, uh, and it checks whether you are jumping to a valid address or not. You can have a stack protector, which is some rudimentary protection about buffer overflows. Mm. But the thing I want to talk about is uh, f-instrument functions. Uh, this uh, is a very powerful tool, actually. You need to declare two functions with some really funky names like sig profile func enter and sig profile func exit. And when you do that and put some also funky flags on the uh, compiler command line, uh, GCC helpfully has this functions exclude list. Uh, so those two functions don't get instrumented as well. Uh, otherwise, we would have an infinite recursive loop. Um, and when you do that, those functions are executed on every entry and exit from every function in your code, uh, which can be poor man's print def, automated print def debugging, basically. You can see um, where the code is being executed. Uh, if you have synchronous uh, output on the serial port, for example, you can also see um, what is the last function that is being executed, which can be really helpful. Uh, this also works on Clang. However, on Clang, you need to put those two functions in a separate um, translation unit because there is no exclude list. So we need to compile that separately uh, without the f instrument functions flag. But otherwise, it works the same. Uh, one thing that Clang has that GCC doesn't is that you can also use f instrument functions after inlining. Uh, and in that version, uh, you don't have those calls for inline functions. Uh, if a function got inlined, then uh, calls to, or this is not really a call on the assembly level, but uh, only proper assembly level uh, function calls are instrumented in this way, which I don't really know why you might prefer that, but you may. Uh, of course, there are some advantages and some limitations of using uh, this. It works everywhere, but you still need uh, some kind of output. Uh, but it may come in handy when you are um, debugging code that runs inside a cross zone, for example. Uh, it has low overhead, aside from the fact that, uh, well, of course, you need output of some kind. And combined with manual printf debugging, that it can be really powerful. But there are, of course, other limitations. Um, you need to correlate the addresses that get printed out with your code. You can do that using GDB or, or Gitra or something, but it will be tedious. You don't have access to variable values. Uh, and uh, it is not really that... Um, uh, it that's, I said that you can correlate the last function that gets executed, but this is not always true. If you have, for example, asynchronous I.O., then uh, the thing you want to output on the serial port might just get buffered, and then you, your port will reboot before the buffer gets printed out. So this is not a 100% uh, always working solution, but this is still really powerful. That, uh, can be helpful in many situations, especially when you don't have a, a possibility to use a proper debugger. Uh, one more thing I want to encourage you, you to use is Linux, uh, or you know how this goes. Uh, <laughs> this might, this of course uh, does not apply to your target uh, board, but uh, your development machine. Um, and why you should use uh, Linux. Let's see a couple of tools that you can use in C and C++ development. Uh, I already talked about GDB. Uh, that works on pretty much everything. Uh, there are sanitizers, and those are uh, limited to GCC and Clang, but that also works pretty much everywhere. Uh, but not on an embedded, usually, because you need a runtime that is relatively heavy and probably won't fit on your board. Um, there is scan build, which is used for um, static analysis of your code. This is also part of the LLVM package, so it works mostly everywhere. But things like S-Trace, for example, or L-Trace, those are Linux only, although, to be fair, 
uh, BSD and Mac OS folks also have D-Trace and uh, Windows is process monitor, so there are equivalents on other places. Uh, but Valgreens doesn't work on modern Mac OS, for example. It only works on Linux and a couple of other Unix-like systems. Uh, RR uh, works only on Linux and is finicky with virtual machines. So you have a lot of tooling on pretty much every platform you can have, but if there are some tools that only work on one platform, then probably that will be Linux, at least if we are talking about uh, the open source ecosystem, because maybe you can have some tools from Microsoft or something, but who uses Visual Studio anymore? Anyway, why does this matter? Uh, we are talking about embedded, right? Right, but if you can run at least some of your code on your computer and not just on your target bo board, you probably should because it opens up a lot of uh, more possibilities for uh, testing and debugging it. Uh, some platforms even uh, allow it to be done very easily. For example, on Zephyr, uh, you can target a native SIM board which compiles your program to a uh, normal Linux process. And this is also a thing that only works on Linux. You cannot do this on, on Mac OS or, or BSD or anything like that. Mm, of course, you cannot test your drivers there. Uh, you may be limited in the choice of libc that, that you are using uh, to, to your native libc of, of your system. But still, this is your embedded code running on your computer. Uh, if you don't use Zephyr, then you probably need to roll your, roll your own. Like you can just take parts of your code and uh, compile it as a separate application. Uh, but this is worth it. This is definitely worth it. You, you should do that as much as possible to test your code, to debug your code, because it allows you to use a lot of more tooling and free yourself from the resource limitations of, of your uh, embedded uh, board. So what you can do, I already talked about address sanitizer. Uh, this is something that you enable on the command line of your Clang or GCC compiler. And uh, when you enable that, when you try, when your program tries to access some memory address that is invalid or leaks memory, you will have it nicely um, printed out on the console and uh, some error code will be returned. This is very handy. However, there are other sanitizers. For example, there's memory sanitizer that, ah, uh, oh, I forgot what it does. Memory sanitizer, I think uh, it uh, checks if you are using the right section of memory, something like that. Anyway, you cannot use it together with other sanitizer. So you cannot enable all the sanitizers at the same uh, time. Another handy one is undefined behavior sanitizer, uh, which, as the name suggests, uh, will try to alert you when you are trying to do some kinds of uh, undefined behavior in your program. For example, in this example, you are doing signed integer overflow, and this is printed as, an, as a runtime error. Uh, like I said, there is also threat sanitizer, uh, which uh, checks for race conditions in your code. For example, if you have different uh, order of uh, locking mutexes. It will alert you about that. And there is memory sanitizer, and I finally have notes for that, and it checks if you are using uninitialized memory, not just invalid address, but you have a valid address, but you didn't initialize it, and it will warn you about it. Uh, of course, there are limitations. Uh, it relies on compile time instrumentation, which is very handy, but if you have an external library, which is binary only or something like that, then you will need to recompile it, or if you can't, then you are screwed. Um, and it only catches a subset of bugs. Uh, famously, uh, C++, not C, but C++ has uh, a rule that if you have a, um, if you have an endless loop without a body, so, so you have a code that does nothing, and you try to hang your program with that, this is illegal, this is undefined behavior, and compilers are free to optimize it. So if you like, if you put while true uh, semicolon uh, and enable optimizations, it will be removed from your code, and the code that is below it will be executed. By but uh, undefined behavior sanitizer doesn't uh, 
find that bug. So yeah, you cannot 100% re rely on it. And also even worse, if a bug is even uh, able to be caught by, for example, undefined behavior sanitizer or, or, or other sanitizer, if you have, for example, unaligned memory access, but possible unaligned memory access, but you just so happen to calculate an address that by chance happens to be aligned, this will not be caught. You, you need to have an actual bug in runtime for it to be caught. Uh, this is what I was talking about. Uh, so one way to minimize the risk of you forgetting about some bugs is of course have a lot of tests and uh, high coverage uh, of your code with automated tests. And of course, uh, you can always have false positives and with uh, Google Sanitizer, this is a little bit hard to manage because uh, you can only configure those using uh, environment variables, which is rather tedious. So introducing Valgrind. Valgrind does a lot of the same thing that other Sanitizer does. It can catch things like uh, invalid memory access as, uh, keep usage uh, problems, uh, uh, memory leaks, and so on, and other things, because this is just one of the tools of Valgrind. There are other, to other tools. Instead of memcheck, you can use Halgrind, which checks for race conditions. Uh, you can use call grind and cache grind, uh, which uh, analyze your um, function call trees and so on. Uh, but memcheck does more or less the same thing as address sanitizer but it does it on unmodified binaries. Uh, so it does just-in-time instrumentation of binary code and analyzes that. Uh, like I said, there are other tools, like you can use cache grind and call grind to profile your code basically and see what calls were. You can use massive if you are using heap, which you probably don't on a meta, but if you do, then you can see a plot of uh, heap usage and what allocates how much memory and so on. Um, like I said, Valgrind has the advantage that you can just test anything with it. You can test release binaries, external libraries, and so on. Um, and it's highly configurable. And if you uh, are testing your own code, then you can use Valgrind's library to mark, for example, you can put something like this, and it will not treat a uh, variable as undefined, even if it would otherwise. But of course, the code will be slow. You get like eight times slower execution of the code because uh, it basically runs something like a virtual machine uh, to, to emulate or, or all your code. So there is a significant performance impact. Uh, and again, it only catches a subset of bugs only when they happen and so on, that because it doesn't understand um, your code, your C code, or it only understands binary uh, compiled code, then it has no concept of uh, type checking, for example. And it can crash in some situations, for example, I tried, because famously, uh, I think it is used in some quite large projects, so I tried running Firefox under Valgrind, but it crashed because uh, it couldn't cope with cloning Linux processes and so on. So in some situations it might not work, but usually it does. And when you try different um, approaches at the same time, then uh, you can get very uh, good results. Uh, another thing uh, you might consider using is scan build. Uh, this is um, static analyzer for your code. You basically put scan build before your make or CMake or whatever you are using and it will generate a report when it sees some suspicious code. Uh, and RR, this is, I think this is the last thing I have on the agenda. Uh, yeah, sorry about just doing that. Uh, RR is uh, a tool originally developed at Mozilla. Uh, one problem with it is that you need some very specific hardware to do it. Uh, if you have an Intel processor, then it it's basically works. But if you have AMD, well, you, it needs to be relatively new uh, or even newer ARM processor like 
probably Raspberry Pi 5 is okay, but anything uh, earlier than that won't work. It will work on an M1 Mac, but only if you boot Linux natively, so uh, yeah, a little bit problematic, but when you get it to work, also doesn't like virtual machines, uh, but when you get it to work, uh, on this, here you can see that you can record execution of your application and then type RR replay. This looks just like a normal GDP session, ex uh, except when you hit some problem, you can do things like reverse next and just go back in time with execution of your code, uh, put a breakpoint and do reverse continue and just replay what happened uh, to create the bug again. How does it work? Um, when you record your application, it virtualizes uh, anything that can be non-deterministic about your program execution. Uh, this has some CPU overhead, but not really that much, about 20%. And when you replay, uh, it doesn't do those system calls, for example, uh, it doesn't really do them. Instead, it injects the result from the original uh, execution. So if you have a network application, for example, during the replay, it doesn't access the network. It just uh, behaves as if the receive call uh, received the same data as it did in the original run. Um, so you can basically record some problem and then replay it multiple times deterministically as if the program was running your life using debugging and you can uh, do reverse execution as well. Uh, but you cannot generally move it to other machines. This is really much tied into the CPU type and so on. So, so as long as you're on the same computer, it will work, but otherwise not necessarily. Uh, as a side note, GDB can also do this, at least in theory, because when I tried doing that, uh, it didn't do much. So I would recommend sticking to RR, at least for the time being. So, those are some tools that I recommend you using, some tips on uh, debugging your C code uh, in embedded, but also in other contexts. This is everything from me. If you have any questions, then this is the time to ask them. And if you want access to this presentation, then you can scan this QR code. So, are there any questions? Sure. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I write down a few questions. Uh, first, uh, how do you recommend to find a bug which appeared uh, when we turn on optimization or increased optimization level and just stop work? Oh. <laughs> That is a bit tricky. Uh, I think there isn't really much you can do other than uh, tracing through optimized code on the assembly level, or maybe you can try uh, analyzing it using Ghidra or something like that, and just see if you if you see anything suspicious in in the resulting code. But yeah, if if something uh, stops working when you enable optimizations, then you can either just spend a lot of time searching for what you did wrong or you can just disable optimizations for that function which is what we ended up doing when when we had that problem with drivers this uh, this is another thing that this wasn't our code this this was a code from from a hardware vendor uh some drivers and we found out that those are written in such a way that you cannot uh, enable optimizations so so we just disabled them for for this code and second similar question, uh, I have a bug, so I add print to find out what's going on and bug disappears. Ah, <laughs> yeah, that also happens sometimes. Um, what can you do about it? Static analysis sometimes helps because if you have bugs like that, then this is probably some kind of undefined behavior or some kind of a race condition. So uh, it can sometimes be caught using static analysis. It can sometimes be caught, uh, uh, caught by uh, 
running your code under, under Threat Sanitizer maybe, or Valgrind using the Hellgrinch tool. Um, but yeah, this is hard. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've shown you some tips, but I don't have answer for everything. <laughs> okay, and last question, maybe not directly related, but somehow. Uh, what kind of test, test framework uh, do you recommend? Uh, Google Test or something else? Uh, this is a little bit tricky question because actually here at AV System we have our own. Okay. <laughs> it is actually open source. You can go to our GitHub and uh, see a project called AVS Commons. And there is uh, a framework, AVS Unit, as part of the AVS Commons repo. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, you can use gtest or, or whatever feels comfortable for you. Or I have seen many open source projects just writing plain old applications that just uh, execute some code and then uh, do old style, just plain C asserts on, on the results. Uh, so the, the test framework is really there only to, to help you write the code and maybe um, make it a little bit comfortable executing it. But it doesn't really matter that much. Do you see the benefit of having some hardware in the loop simulators as well? Uh, could you repeat? Do you see a big benefit of having hardware in the loop simulators or you are not using uh, such files silly? Can you have your hardware, real hardware connected to some extra test bench just to run set of uh, unit and integration tests on that? Uh, if you can fit the unit and integration tests on your hardware, uh, if you don't have problems with resources, either just uh, a place on the flash memory or RAM, or it may also be the lack of an additional serial, serial port or something like that, uh, then, uh, then of course that is also an option. That is even a better option because you are testing on the target hardware, of course. Uh, but testing on a simulator or, or just as a plain uh, desktop application uh, has some benefits as well because it is easier to do debugging. Uh, it can, you can also just run those tests quicker, uh, more frequently. So I guess the best idea is to just combine both if you can. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh.